On this episode, a researcher reveals evidence of an ancient Roman presence in the Ohio Valley a millennia before Columbus discovered North America. But perhaps, not surprisingly, it's being suppressed. There was one at Lawrenceburg, Indiana, that was 33 feet tall. It's fairly well documented by a couple of local folks. None of that actually made it into the official history, though. And, and the same family later was paid to bulldoze it. Welcome to your Wednesday. Uh, the other night, uh, one of the uh, classic movie channels was playing Spartacus, uh, which I've seen about 10 times, I think. This is Stanley Kubrick's 1960 epic uh, film depicting the Third Servile War in Rome, starring Kirk Douglas and Laurence Olivier, Tony Curtis, uh, Peter Ustinov, Charles Lawton, Gene Simmons, certainly in my top 10 favorite movies of all time. Now, it does play a little fast and loose with the historical facts. Uh, there were a number of slave rebellions in Rome, and there was an actual figure named Spartacus, uh, but he actually died in battle. He wasn't uh, crucified, as is depicted in the film. However, what I would love to see one day is a movie about the Romans in North America, uh, because they were here, apparently. That's right. There is ample evidence of a Roman presence in the Ohio Valley. But wouldn't you know it, it doesn't fit the official narrative, so it is being suppressed. And that is where we're, that is where we're headed for the next 35 minutes or so. My guest is about to reveal archaeological evidence for seafaring visitations by ancient Romans and others in North America, which occurred far before the time of Columbus. Civilizations such as the Greeks, Romans, Chinese, even the Egyptians came to the Americas to seek out commodities such as copper, he says. And he'll discuss how Ohio Valley fortresses bear a strong similarity to ancient structures in the British Isles. Rick Osman was selected for the U.S. Air Force Academy right out of high school. He later attended Vincennes University and earned an Associate of Science in Laser and Electro-Optics Technology. He worked for defense contractors a number of years and then took a job with the U.S. Navy as a civilian, specializing in radar, night vision, and laser equipment for surveillance and munitions guidance. Rick was also reading everything he could find about the weird and unusual history, archaeology, paleontology, geography, cartography, cryptozoology, cryptography, and hollow earth theory. After leaving government employment in 2004, uh, Rick began this hunt for hidden knowledge full time. Rick Osmond, welcome to Conspiracy Unlimited. How are you? I am well, thank you. I want to start with a, a quote from a, a former uh, editor with Ancient American Magazine. He, he said that Columbus wasn't the first to discover America. He may have been the last. How do you respond to that? Pretty close, but with a couple of uh, accommodations. One being... I would go with the Oscar Wilde quote of many people discovered America before Columbus. They just had the good sense to not talk about it. <laughs> and, and the other one is that we do have other records. So it, it, to say that uh, Columbus was the first even to record it is also false. We had the, the Norse narratives and we have other narratives from other cultures. Sure. And, and so, uh, the, the, the Viking settlement in, in, uh, Newfoundland or Vineland, as they called it, is now, you know, pretty much accepted uh, across the board. But I mean, we can go much further back as you have uh, been researching. First of all, uh, you have a background in the military. Uh, how did you become involved in, uh, let's let's call it uh, alternative archaeology? Uh, it, my very first start was there were two older gentlemen in a very small town where I grew up who were themselves. Let's call it avocational archaeologists and historians. And they told me about this line of fortresses that went across southern Indiana. And at first I thought, yeah, okay, a couple old codgers. And I, the more I researched it, the more I discovered they were absolutely correct. There were ancient stone fortresses scattered across southern Indiana. And when I say scattered, it was generally in a pretty straight line that stretched from uh near Clarksville or Jeffersonville, Indiana, to a small town called Miram, current day town called Miram. And they had stone fortresses at those locations. They also had earthen fortresses in and around that and mounds and a lot of other features. So 
I became enthralled with that at about age 14. Then I had to go make a living. So I was delayed until my retirement, basically, from being fully involved in this. What is the state of these these fortresses? Are they have they been completely excavated? Are they open to the public? Uh, tell me about them. A couple of the sites are open to the public, uh, but there's the remnants are very difficult to discern because they've been pretty much utterly destroyed. With the embankments, you know, the earthen embankments and stuff, you can still see traces in LIDAR. You really can't see it much from on the ground. There's just not enough left. What about artifacts, other artifacts associated with these forts? Certainly. Um, in particular, the, the two at each end of that line also had what they call stone box graves. And those are slabs of limestone that have been shaped and uh, not stacked exactly, but erected into a box shape to hold a body. In all cases uh, of those two places, there were no artifacts in the grave itself. Uh, nearby, there were artifacts in the graves in other sites very nearby. And they're also analogous to another place, completely different place that uses a very similar feature with a different name. They call it slab-sided graves in Wales. But they're contemporaneous and they're made the same. So, you know, draw your own conclusions. And these are contemporaneous with with graves in in Rome as well? Uh, all over the in Roman Indiana. Empire? Yeah. Uh, yes, well, yes. Actually, the very late Roman Empire, they did do some of those. Uh, but in that case, it's the Eastern because the the Western, the Roman Empire, rather than Byzantine, had already collapsed and reverted into barbarism. The Eastern, uh, they they still did some slab sided graves. Of course, that was you know like middle tier, lower middle class folks. The elite still had big fancy graves. And tell me about the, the title of your book, "The Graves of the Golden Bear: Ancient Fortresses and Monuments of the Ohio Valley." What does the Golden Bear refer to? Well, that's one of the secrets of reading the book, but I'll give you this part. It refers to a character known as King Arthur. In this case, it's King Arthur II. And he was buried in three different places before he found his final resting place. All right. Now, we have found, or there have been found, Roman coins, Greek coins, all over the o the Ohio Valley. Uh, have you personally uh, uncovered any Roman or Greek artifacts in the Ohio Valley? Debatable. Uh, I, I have uncovered artifacts that are consistent with Roman occupation, but I can't prove that they were Roman built. Not yet. I'm still working on that. Can you give me some hint as to what these artifacts were or are? Uh, yes, stone structures. And, oh. and possibly some concrete, too, but I haven't managed to get that sample off private property and get it tested. What can you tell me about some of the coins that have been found? Um, some of them, I mean, how far back do they go? I mean, what what emperor has been um, minted on those coins? Does it, do they go to far back as Claudius or when? No, actually, the ones uh, of the ones of which I'm aware that have been found in the Ohio Valley in particular are late second century coins. So they're, you know, they're a century after, century and a half after Claudius. Um, for the most part, there's a couple of very early second century coins in that, in the group that's known. There was a group of 52 coins that was found and examined and then disappeared again. Uh, but they are s late second up into mid third century AD. The total, as of just a few years ago, the total that we could put together on the number of Roman coin finds in the eastern United States was just shy of 400. And that was including a couple of caches, like the 52 coin cache at Clarksville, Indiana, and a 36 coin cache upriver from there, upriver from a place called uh, Rose Island. And then smaller collections as well. Then in 2000, 13, I was introduced to a person in Utah who had found a single area with 396 coins in it. In Utah? In Utah. And wow. that was the first any of us had been aware of large caches, at least, 
west of the Rockies. Are there any museums uh, that 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 have these coins on display? In other words, ha- has have these discoveries been given sort of the imprimatur of official officialdom, if I can use that term? I'll answer that with not anymore. <laughs> there was one display in Clarksville, Indiana, at the Falls of the Ohio Museum that they had two of that original fifty-two coin cash that were on display and they had replicated those to emulate or simulate the 52 coin cash. Uh, but that is no longer part of the uh, repertoire at that museum. And do we know why? I ask rhetorically. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a pretty good idea. Of, they also don't want to believe in the very, very strong local um, legends, let's use that term, of Prince Matic having colonized that in 1170 or 670 A.D., depending on which version you like better. He was uh, from Wales, wasn't he? Yes. And his half-brother, apparently, was King Arthur II. Hmm. And they, you believe, or it is understood by some, they they colonized or, or settled in the Ohio Valley. Yes. They, they didn't start out in the Ohio Valley, obviously. No. They started out at a coastline somewhere. And the most popular legend or most popular spot of that coastline is near Mobile, Alabama. And at one time, the Daughters of the American Revolution had erected a very large plaque there on the shores of Mobile Bay commemorating that coming ashore by that foreign power. Are there any corresponding... Um, I guess from the oral tradition uh, of Native Americans uh, talking about encounters with Roman soldiers or on the flip side, any documents from surviving from from uh, the Roman era uh, talking about uh, encountering uh, uh, Native Americans. Let me start that answer with this. How many segments can we devote to this? Well, we- <laughs> <laughs> because there are a lot of incidents. Well, okay, on documents, because that's what historians use exclusively, I might add. There are descriptions in Roman histories of a plant that is very spice like, and uh, the physical description is that of, well, a chili pepper. Um, we have pictures, photo- uh, not photographs, images. Uh, drawings, paintings in ancient Egyptian tombs and other structures of maize and pineapple and a few other squashes, you know, things that are at least accepted by most arch- uh, anthropologists as being native to the Americas, and yet they're in ancient Egypt. We have a statue of Buddha uh, depicted holding an ear of corn in one hand and a pineapple in the other. And it's very solidly dated. The statue is very solidly dated to about 1200 AD. So, you know, a couple hundred years, 300 years before Columbus, very solidly. The incidents of all kinds of flora and fauna having crossed oceans, apparently by themselves, if you listen to the archaeologists and historians, uh, is well in excess of 400 different species. Uh, Dr. Carl Johannesson has done that magical work of documenting all those things and the reasoning behind they could not have arrived alone. Um, And some of the periods, uh, the ages that they appear are phenomenal. We're talking 10, 12, 14,000 years ago, they appeared in the human, yeah, remains. And, you know, we're we're talking pretty much like um, various and sundry types of insects or mites that are unique to humans. They won't populate on other animals, and yet they show up in the remains, or their remains show up in the remains of ancient humans. So we know that they were here, and they didn't come across the Bering Strait because they can't withstand uh, frozen temperatures. The parasites, particularly some of the gut parasites, have life cycles that involve being in the ground for a period of time. Well, you can't do that up there in a frozen tundra so it's not possible that they came over alone and it's not possible that they came over with someone walking across Beringia they had to be 
with mariners. And, and you have more uh, argument for mariners. The island of Crete has tools that are 120,000 years old. You still can't walk there. and You couldn't walk there 120,000 years ago. The island continent of Australia has been populated in excess of 60,000 years, according to some, pop- some population anthropologists. And you still can't walk there, and you couldn't walk there 60,000 years ago. So they were sailing. They weren't just sailing. They were also navigating. They were much more cognitively capable than we want to grant them. The, so the, the the Romans may have also, even though we're talking second, third century, they may have been latecomers uh, oh, to North America. I, my contention is, and and I've worked up a little bit of evidence on this. It's not you know completely cut and dried. They followed the Carthaginians, and I think probably the Carthaginians followed someone else. At what point do we decide that they follow someone back to America? Did the Americans export things before the Europeans knew they existed? Very, very possible, particularly when you look at some of the copper from, you know, 3,500, 5,000 years ago. Right, yeah, right. We do have this evidence of uh, this enormous copper mining operation on the shores of Lake Superior. There simply wasn't enough copper in Europe to, to fuel the Bronze Age, so it had to come from somewhere. But the size of the sh- the vessels to ship that copper back that amount of copper back, they must have been enormous. That depends on how many of them there were. You know, if they were built by uh, Archimedes, then yes, they were huge. They, they handled 4,000 people plus cargo. But if they were built by someone like, what was that character's name? Oh, yeah, Janus. He and his five men went on a voyage to find a golden fleece. And it took them, what, 10 years? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and and we can also go to a shipwreck, 1000 BC shipwreck off the coast of Wales that held 10 ingots, I believe it was 10 ingots of tin and 83 ingots or whatever it was of copper. And these are bun ingots, so they're, you know, 10, 12, 15 pounds a piece. They can be up to 40. But this cargo apparently was enough to make this heavily laden boat sink in a little bit of sea. So the cargo hit the bottom pretty much intact. The boat's completely gone 3,000 years later. But if they were, and this, this is where I get into a big argument with the archaeologists and anthropologists who claim, oh, the copper was all coming from the continent. Okay, then where was the tin coming from? Because it was only in Cornwall. So the tin mixed with the copper to make bronze, but the tin is not available on the continent. It was coming from Cornwall, England. Right. So the, to my notion, the entire payload was coming at that point from the British Isles and headed towards the continent. Hmm. Of course, the copper didn't come from there either. The copper had to come from somewhere else and pick up the tin on the way. What do you, how do you feel about the idea that the, the Phoenicians all, were also involved in that copper mining operation and that they perhaps even brought giants with them? Um, how do I feel about that? Well, I'm confident, completely confident, they were trading in copper and other precious metal, all kinds of commodities. They they were the UPS of their age. <laughs> what can Brown do for you? <laughs> I mean, they carried their own genetics all over the world, too. Uh, did they carry giants with them? I believe those giants were probably mercenaries, much like they would be today. Um, you You can find giant skeletons intact been studied uh, go to the Canary Islands in fact the gonches were seven and a half eight feet tall and they're not the, the academia does not dispute that and they have blonde or red hair and they had blue or gray eyes and they weren't in with one little island of the Canaries that was left when the Spanish got there you know, the Spanish were very late comers to that very close island um, the gonches were erecting huge stone structures and tall enough to look over them. So, whatever you think, there hmm. were you they know, taking were they taking them with them, or were they themselves giants? Hey, friends! Don't know if you heard the news, but the good people at YouTube arbitrarily decided to demonetize my YouTube channel, Strange Planet. Now, 
they claim that we are re-uploading content that doesn't belong to us, which is entirely false. I own the Conspiracy Show. Of course, I own Conspiracy Unlimited, and I own the Rock and Roll Twilight Zone. And all of those and this radio show can be found on the YouTube channel. Now, we are reapplying for reinstatement in about 30 days. I'm not sure if we'll prevail. Something tells me we won't. It seems as if YouTube is targeting programs like mine. However, I need now your support more than ever. We've taken a big financial hit by losing the monetization on YouTube. So now I need your help more than ever. I hope you'll consider becoming an official supporter of The Conspiracy Show, the YouTube channel, and my podcast, Conspiracy Unlimited. Here's what you need to do. Go to patreon.com forward slash strange planet. Patreon.com forward slash strange planet. And consider donating $50 a month, $20 a month, $10 a month, or whatever you feel comfortable giving. Thank you so much. I've never needed you more. Researcher author Rick Osmond is here discussing evidence for the presence of ancient Romans in the Ohio Valley. The hidden history of North America. The question that immediately comes to mind is, you know, why is it being hidden? Why do we know so little about the true nature of pre-Columbian North America? What is the agenda here? My... Uh, let's say, call it structured conjecture, that's where I'll go with this one, is that it, if it is ever completely known, it would threaten the sovereignty of the current governments involved. Because hmm. all of the land claims go back to the papal bull uh, entitled Terra Nullis. If you find a land that was out, is without Christians or Christianity, then, well, hey, it's fair game take it. And the people, well, they're not people if they're not Christians. Do anything you want with them. And that has gone on since 1451. Now you talk about uh, Columbus in 1492, the legal standing was already in place. And it was in regard to the Congo and the other areas where they were taking slaves. I should say where they were buying slaves. So I'm not I'm not quite sure I understand I, I follow that. Um, okay, when, when Columbus got to America, right? He did the first thing he did was he held a ceremony on the beach and he erected two flags, one Christian, one Spanish. Both of them were laying a claim to the land. Right. All subsequent land claims stem from that in one way or another, whether it's concessions at the end of a war or outright conquest or trade as in, like, say, the Louisiana Purchase, they all stem initially from that papal bull saying, hey, if they're not Christians, you can have them. All right, but let's say, for example, by recognizing a Viking settlement in Newfoundland, that, how does that, that doesn't upset the apple cart, that doesn't upset... Uh, oh, you but know, it does. It does because when you go back through all the history. Leif Erikson was a Christian. He was no longer a Norse, uh, Norse god pagan. He was a Catholic because Olaf the Great, King Olaf, Saint Olaf, however you want to call him, had converted to Catholicism with the church's promise that they would help him consolidate all the petty kingdoms of Scandinavia into, well, his rule. And, and that happened. That's why he's sainted. Ah, okay. So by the time uh, Leif Erikson landed in Newfoundland, he was a Christian. Yes, but he did not hold the ceremony. He just went for a good time. He just wanted to see it for himself. Right, his brother right. had told him. Thor Thornen had told him about it. All right, but the you know the Phoenicians you know, or the Minoans or whomever may have come ashore, uh, you know, they're, how they're, does, they're how hardly, does that affect the they're, they're hardly going to lay claim uh, if we were to acknowledge you know that they were here. Right, they're not going to lay claim. Here's what it does, though: it opens up the floodgates for suggesting that someone before Columbus could have been there, and anybody before Columbus, if they colonized in any way, shape, or form, could lay a claim. Hmm. Interesting. So, so what does that say about, say, Prince Matic? 
you know, 670, they were Christians. If, 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 and Queen Elizabeth almost went through with this one too, by the way, Queen Elizabeth the first, I should say, of using the Welsh legends to claim all of North America. And that was uh, Dee's suggestion to her. John D was very up on this stuff. So, so why didn't she go through with it? She didn't have the Navy to handle the Spanish at the time. Okay. And, and Maddock, uh, again, what, what uh, era was he? What, what uh, century? It, well, at the time she was pushing the claim, it was claimed that he left Wales in 1170. But when you go back and examine the existing records, and there are existing records, it was actually 570. It was the 6th century rather than the 12th century. And you can uh, very easily and convincingly associate that event with a huge extraterrestrial impact event in the North Atlantic, because Maddock was the admiral of the Welsh Navy, um, to driving him off course to North America for some 10 years. And that event happened in our calendar in 536 AD. Now, that would have put it at 562 in the Welsh calendar because that was the Chaldee calendar rather than the Roman Catholic calendar. So you have these events that coincide and, and the, the impact event is very solidly proven uh, because partially because of um, – Chevron formations in the Carolinas where the tidal wave drove stuff ashore for 27 miles. So this, um, this would have been what, what drove Maddock off course and, and why he landed. Right. 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 And, and it took him 10 years to get back. And when he get, did get back, he found that that impact event had also devastated pretty much all of the agriculture in the British Isles and created a literal dark age. It darkened the skies of the Northern Hemisphere. Um, so by then, they were Catholics. I'm sorry, they were Christians. They were not Catholics. They were Chaldees. The Catholic Church was just beginning to come into the British Isles in mass. No pun intended. <laughs> but the Chaldees had been practicing Christianity and established Christian churches by about 39 A.D., and in fact, the Catholic Encyclopedia credits the very first Catholic Church as being built in Britain. It also alludes to Helena, Constantine's mother, being from Britain and already a Christian when she got to Rome. Fascinating. Yes. How do you feel about the, um, what they call it, America's Stonehenge, which really bears little resemblance to Stonehenge, but it is a stone circle, uh, sort of scattered around a little bit. But what are your feelings? Who do you think was behind constructing America's Stonehenge? Someone who was very, very intelligent. And I don't know. I mean, as far as ethnicity or anything like that, it really doesn't matter to me. However, if you look out to the east of the viewing platform, what you will find, in addition to you know the solstice stone and the equinox stones, uh, I'm sorry, solstice stones and equinox stone, what you will see is eight minor stones at regular intervals against the eastern sky, and that is very much a Venus calendar, um, and it's very very precise, and it has not changed as much as you would think in 4,600 years or so since it was actually erected. But it's a very good key for telling us when it was erected. Who built it? I don't know. But they built it there. Almost none of the stone there was imported from anywhere, with possible exception of one minor piece of quartz. Size of your thumb. There's some speculation that, it, that the Canaanites may have been involved, uh, and there may have been human sacrifice performed there. Well, there's a table there that would be consistent with bloodletting, um, but it could also be consistent with making lye. It could also be consistent with a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, it's got a trough around it that is a good drain. That, that drain can function in a lot of ways. 
Yes, human sacrifice is a possibility, particularly because of the size of it. If you were slaughtering something and butchering it on that table, it would have to be something the size of a cow. In the ancient times up there, deer and eastern bison are about the only thing that would come to mind. Deer would not fill it. Eastern bison would barely fill it. And that and they would look small on it, actually. Eastern bison were tiny. Not, not anything like the plains bison we have today. Right, right. Uh, these stone circles, are, are there any evidence for these in the Ohio Valley? Surprisingly, yes. And surprisingly, it's recorded. The um, geologic report for the state of Indiana of 1873 lists a number of stone monuments, generally near the Ohio River, but not all of them, in the, fix, uh, in the figure of an eight, a figure eight. One is very much a yin and yang symbol. It's a perfect rendition of a yin and yang symbol. Um, there's a fiddle-shaped mound at Anderson, Indiana. It, it's not stone. It's has stone in it, but it's mostly a uh, earthen mound. There was a stone structure, a number of stone towers, I would call them signal towers or observation towers, whatever you want to call them, all along the Ohio from Pittsburgh to Cairo, Illinois for its entire length. Um, in fact, about every two miles there was one for a while, for hundreds of years in historic times, they still stood. There was one at Lawrenceburg, Indiana, that was 33 feet tall. It's fairly well documented by a couple of local folks. None of that actually made it into the official histories, though. I did go talk to the family that owned the ground for a long time. And, and the same family um, later was paid, one of the members was paid to bulldoze it because he owned an excavating company. Now there's a big water tower in the same place, but it it lets you observe some 25 miles of the length of the Ohio River. Hmm. Getting and there back, are a lot of other features geographically that go along with it. Sure. We don't have time. Going, going back to these uh, fortresses, some of them are earthen, earthen uh, mounds and so forth. Who were they defending against? Whoever would attack them, I guess. I, I the the actual warfare and the implements of that warfare, the only thing that I found that's consistent with Roman warfare of that era, and we're talking 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th century A.D., is I found very spherical ballista stones, you know, ammo. It's like big BBs, 40 millimeter, 70 millimeter in diameter, that range. Too big to put into a pocket sling. Too small to use a cannon, although you, know, you could build a cannon for it. Um, in fact, the Spanish did, but they didn't have a good way of mass producing them while they were in America. The stones are the ones you find typically have a spall mark consistent with impacting something. Um, if it hit a stone wall, then the small mark is large. If it hit a skull, the small small mark is virtually non-existent, but you can detect it. Uh, and when I say a ballista ball, this is a machine. It would look a little bit like a crossbow, but it would be a unit-served piece of gear. It would it would be a piece of artillery. And when Rome conquered Carthage, they listed fifteen hundred and thirty-six pieces of artillery that worked on this same method as captured goods. Um, so to when you find these ballista balls, you don't know whose they were. You only know that they're consistent with certain armies. Carthage, Rome, certain Greek armies. Um, Mauritania had them, and possibly, completely possibly, the Welsh. What about you shield? Have, oh, sorry, go ahead. You also asked about native accounts, and yes, yes, there are a lot of them. And one of the native accounts, as recorded by Henry Roy Schoolcroft, is about how 
a crew of men would make these small boulders, round balls, and launch them. So maybe the natives started this rather than the Romans. I don't know. I, I'm not even going to speculate about which way the original tech or whatever went. There's no point in it. It went everywhere. Would the Romans have brought horses with them? Almost certainly. But they would have been a small Welsh pony, so how are you going to tell the difference? Hmm. Um, what about breastplates, and, and helmets? There was one of, yes, we have found some of those. We've also found uh, Spanish helmets in places they shouldn't have been. Um, back to the Welsh horses for just a moment. Yes. There was one excavated from a mound in Wisconsin, and the archaeologist said, rebury it. We don't care. It's got to be historic. It doesn't fit the timeline. You must throw it out. Does not Does not fit our particular timeline. Yeah. So, so we have a history of all these things showing up and being promptly ignored or declared a hoax or anything that will discredit it. Do you have any what I'll call mainstream archaeologists, let's say, who have written in peer-reviewed peer-reviewed journals and so forth? Do you have anyone from that world on your side who who tacitly acknowledges or it accepts it, but says, "I that would be career suicide. I can't go there." Well, I have to go with the t- retirees who just don't care anymore. And yes, there are a few. There are a few retirees who know all this stuff. Uh, that that diffusion, as we call it, technical, cultural, genetic, whatever aspect of it you want to chase, yes, it happened, and they, yes, they know it. They are so busy concocting ways to explain it away that they will not accept the evidence. Writing. Uh, there was this guy, his name was uh, Powell, uh, Major John Wesley Powell, and he was concurrently the director of the USGS and the founder and director of the Bureau of Ethnicity at the Smithsonian Institution. So what did that mean, really? It meant that he could direct exactly where the railroads would go and tear up the land and destroy evidence. And it happened, I can lay out a half a dozen cases where it's very clear the railroad did not need to be there, but he directed it. And he wasn't the only one. There were also, uh, let's call them politicians, some elected, some not, who promoted this behavior, obscuration, obfuscation, and destruction of evidence. Very deliberate. Well, Rick, we are going to leave it there for now, but I'm sure we'll um, we'll do a part two and part three. Uh, we'll if you're, if you're willing and able. Excellent. This is uh, fascinating. And again, uh, the book, The Graves of the Golden Bear, Ancient Fortresses and Monuments of the Ohio Valley, that's available at Amazon. Uh, give us a website as well, if you could. Sure. It's on Grave Distractions Publications, which is not me. It, it is my publisher. It's real. Um, and it's also at Books a Million and a few other places, um, Barnes & Noble, etc. It's everywhere. GraveDistractions.com is the publisher's website. And again, the book, The Graves of the Golden Bear, Ancient Fortresses and Monuments of the Ohio Valley. Rick Osman, thank you so much. A real pleasure. Thank you, Richard. Well, before I dim the lights in my little studio beneath the stairs, I'm going to tell you what's coming up on episode 76 of Conspiracy Unlimited. But before that, do you have a dog? Would you like to develop your dog's hidden intelligence to eliminate bad behavior and create the obedient, well-behaved pet of your dreams?